for Expedia. We've got a great panel today with diverse and extensive experience in dealing with real-world privacy issues, including the expanding area of mobile privacy. To my right, we have Jim DeGraw with Ropes and Gray, then Ruth Gowdy with Samsung, Lydia Parnes with Wilson Sonsini, and Lara Keo Hoffman with Autodesk. We thought the best way to walk through the many issues um, we're going to cover today would be to walk through from the experience from the perspective of a startup. So we have a startup and we'll, we'll walk through these issues as they grow and launch their business. So the scenario is we have a couple founders with a great idea and they decide to launch a startup. At the beginning, their priorities will probably not exactly be privacy, but rather building their product, maybe expanding their team, doing market studies, thinking about branding and IP issues, launching their product, improving their product, and growing their user base. Many of privacy issues won't arise until later for most startups, particularly as they um, go to market and start collecting user data, including uh, sensitive information such as location-based information. So let's talk about our startup, EcoCentry. EcoCentry for defenders of a sustainable lifestyle. EcoCentry is a free app and also a website offering information about sustainable products, transportation options like bike share, car share, electric car charging stations, foods, restaurants, and hotels. Initially, the startup is based in Wisconsin. And if we have any angel investors in the audience, feel free to come up and talk to us afterwards. <laughs> so the team initially is not certain exactly what kinds of personal information will be useful. build. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I give Laura credit for the graphics here, which I've not actually tested out. So this is going to throw me a little bit. <laughs> okay. So we anyway, the startup is is off, is going to collect registration information. They're not sure exactly what they might need, but there's some information that they that they anticipate are definitely going to be useful. So definitely name an email gender date of birth may allow them in the future to customize in ways that will contribute to the success of their, of their um, app. They will probably want to send push notifications. They will probably want to access contacts of, um, of their users so as to personalize that experience, access geolocation data so they can provide just-in-time information um, geographically specific to their users. Um, social sign-on is always good, allows friends to tell other friends about this great app um, EcoCentry, and then we'll also talk about terms of service and privacy policy, which hopefully at some point the, the startup will start thinking about. So the, um, the app is going to trigger from the early on, the app's going to trigger some, trigger some basic privacy issues just related to mobile in general. So I'm going to turn it over to Jim and Ruth to talk about what some of these initial issues might be. Thanks, Kathy. Um, when Ruth and I looked at this, we kind of did a low whistle and said, gosh, lots of issues, right? And you have to think of the issues that you see in any simple app that's going to be on a mobile platform from a multitude of perspectives. You have to think of it, first of all, from the platform perspective. You know, what are the rules of the platform and how does the platform work? Right? That's kind of the basics, but your engineers might think about, well, that's my interface. And I think about the interface and that's it. But the platform actually has a large number of features, and it also has rules of the road that they have to pay attention to for how do we do things like access to geolocation data. Then you need to think about the regulatory scheme in which they lie as well. There's the Washington perspective, the FTC or whatnot, um, rules of the road that they want you to think about as well, as well as the individual state attorney generals from the US perspective and outside the US you know, a number of different regulators as well about the collection of data, about the kinds of data that you can process and what you can do with the data. So Ruth's going to talk about the analytics for a second, but I just want to put out there, the first question you need to think about when you're talking about data is, what is the kind of data I'm collecting and is there something that's known as PII, PHI, though it just doesn't really touch that, or is it really all just sensitive data? And one of the trends that we see in Washington that's very strong in the Attorney Generals is that the dialogue around what is data and what is not data and what is personal information and all these alphabet soup uh, 
that we've been thinking about over the years of regulating specific data fields, name, gender, date of birth, is going away. You need to think about sensitive data overall, which includes geolocation data, which includes metadata potentially. The President's report that came out a couple weeks ago talks about the difference between metadata and PII, personal identifiable information, is basically going away. You need to think about all those things when you think about the three different paradigms that you're viewing the perspective for and what the paradigms mean when you think about notice, use, and processing overall. But Ruth, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, sure. that data <clears throat> point first. Uh, yeah, sure. So you know, I completely agree with that. I mean, what there's a lot of different perspectives on what's sensitive data, what isn't sensitive data. This is not something that we have statutorily here in the U.S. If you go to the EU, you have that statutory distinction. Uh, here we have, of course, as everyone knows, sector-specific privacy laws. We have Bramlage Bliley, we have HIPAA, there's the Video Privacy Protection Act. We purposefully tailored our startup so that they didn't trip into any of those because this is really more about general mobile apps and not about specific sector-specific privacy laws. Uh, but if you look at both the FTC uh, report uh, on mobile privacy and also the California uh, uh, Privacy on the Go report, the California Attorney General report, uh, both of those reports have this concept now that, that are being introduced that certain types of data should be treated as sensitive. Uh, so clearly financial data, <clears throat> medical data, geolocation data is something that is definitely being treated as sensitive. And that's something that may not be as obvious if you don't practice in this space routinely. You have to be very careful about geolocation. And then there are other things, too, that the FTC report suggests we should start considering as sensitive data. And those would include things like photos, videos, your contact list. Again, things that <clears throat> historically you might not necessarily have thought of as sensitive. And I mean, one of the things to keep in mind with respect to the regulatory regime that we have right now in the U.S. is that when the FTC and the California Attorney General issue these reports, they are trying to influence the law. Um, they are not actually able to legislate, we know, and this is a, a point of, of some contention as to how far they're able to go and what it means. Uh, but I would say, at least with respect to geolocation, um, at this point, that's something you definitely want to be careful about. So our um, wonderful startup is clearly going to have to rely on geolocation data because this is effectively a hyper-local events you know, type of app, which means the whole point is you get on your app and you say <clears throat> what kind of eco-friendly stores, restaurants, whatever it is you're looking for are in my location. So you have to access geolocation data in order to make that effective. Uh, under the, the FTC's view, uh, you should have what's called a just-in-time notice. How many people know what just-in-time notices are? Okay, very few. So I'll tell you, basically that's some, a notice that comes up right when the data collection is happening. So we have privacy policies that everybody clicks on at the beginning or they're down at the bottom of the screen or something. The point of the just-in-time notice is to say, hey, right now, in real time, this app is going to collect this piece of data. Uh, and so <clears throat> what I think many of you probably, if you think about the apps that you use that do require geolocation data, the first time you use them, and at this point the practice is only the first time, you'll get a little pop-up on your screen that says, this app wants to use your geolocation data, yes or no. Now, in the case of EcoCentury, if you click no, you basically <clears throat> means that the app isn't going to really function for you. Um, in other cases, you could click no, and the app will basically just function fine. Um, but that's a just-in-time notice. And right now, <clears throat> geolocation data is definitely one of those things that you're starting to see people uh, offer uh, just-in-time notices. And I think the platform rules actually, in many cases, require that. They require well. it. They're built towards that. But the struggle that you see going on in Washington at the moment is what really works. There's a certain point where, I don't know, my eyes glaze when you see too many notices. And you know how much transparency is just uh, ennui, right, or just you know, useless, right? Um, I moved to California a couple of years ago, and when I bought my house, I received a packet that was this thick 
of notices that are required under law, right? It's insane, right? Um, I read one of them, which was to tell me all the crime on the block, so now I know who was growing marijuana on my block, right? <laughs> but that was about it, right? You know, because the rest of it was just meaningless boilerplate at a certain point, and you see that struggle going on. Um, the president's report that came out a couple of weeks ago strongly said that if you think consumers are reading these notices, you're out of your mind. Um, and that's actually probably practically true. And the more pop-up notices you have, the more that it will get in interfere with the usability of the device and people won't want to use it. And that's a struggle we have. You know, the FTC and California AG, you know, well, certain commissioners in the FTC, I think it's fair to say, think that transparency is a goal to have, and the more transparency you have, the better off you are about the practice of the app. However, there is this trend that your startup needs to be worried about, which is you know, people looking beyond that and opening up the hood. You see it in the big data report, but you also see it coming out of the president's report and elsewhere. What's really happening with the data? Right? The Google case that everyone's worried about, the right to be forgotten, well, California has a statute that also has the right to be erased for teenagers. But also, in even the FTC big data report, they were advocating that the data brokers um, build a web portal for people to be able to go in and see what data is being collected upon them and to be able to access and delete that. Um, that seems unworkable on lots of levels, but it's an indication of a trend. Right? And people are worried about, in the regulatory space, about the data uses that, you, that are happening on these devices. So you have a transparency goal that you need to meet at the moment, but you also need to think about it and work with your startup to think, what are you going to be doing with the data? How sensitive is the data? And even the data that can be drawn from your data. The fact that I belong to a service that tracks my eco-friendly um, hotels means I'm probably a little left-leaning. Um, and if it's tracking my hotels, I hope that it's tracking the hotels that I go to on a regular basis for business that's being associated with my expense reports. Right? There's lots of sensitive information that flows through just the use of it. And how that's being used will be future point of regulation that people should start thinking about longer term. You need to bake that into your platform as well. Um, Ruth, I know you all make some platforms out there, or at least some of the Samsung companies do. <laughs> we do. <clears throat> I'm not sure I'm prepared to talk about those particular platforms right now. Um, but I think that kind of building on, on what, <clears throat> what Jim has said, there is this tension between disclosure and uh, you know, overburdening people with notifications and how much transparency is too much. So um, one thing I guess we should back up what we didn't specifically talk about is um, at the that many startups may well miss, <clears throat> at the outset you need to have a privacy policy. Now that's just best practice in the U.S. Um, under California law, I think as many of you know, under Cal APA, uh, you do have to have a privacy policy. Any website or online service in the California Attorney General has taken the position that mobile apps are online services, you have to have a privacy policy that meets certain features. So, <clears throat> and under the platform rules, most of the platforms, platforms like um, uh, the Apple platform and Android, will require you to have the um, platform, the, the privacy policy available before download. So if you want to post on something like a Google Play or iTunes, you're going to have to have your privacy policy, you're going to have to have it available. That's, um, there was a agreement that the California Attorney General reached with multiple of the platform providers, um, Samsung not included, that <clears throat> that requires specifically requires that as a capability. Again, going back to that concept that Jim talked about, that disclosure is desirable. Uh, the other thing that the FTC and the California Attorney General <clears throat> have been pushing quite significantly that I really don't think very many people are taking them up on yet is this concept that you should make it very simple. That you'd have like a layered notice, like about layered notices, so that you can just see certain categories and click on them. Um, perhaps, you know, in some cases links to other things, but very simple law, very clear, very clean. In my experience, like I said, I don't think too many people are taking them up on yet that yet, but that goes to the fact that I think the regulators do recognize you, uh, it's desirable to have something that, that communicates very quickly as opposed to the you know multi-inch stack of paper that, that Jim talked about he received when he bought his house. Um, but you definitely, at a minimum, need to have a privacy policy. It needs to tell people what you're collecting, what you're doing with it, how you're going to modify your privacy policy, if there's a way to access the data, how to do that, and then the effective data policy. So, so pretty basic stuff. Uh, you do need to be sure you have 
that privacy policy in place. And I think it's worth mentioning on the privacy policy to launch your company. And this is kind of the key when you think about the data to, you want to collect. The engineers need to know what it says, right? The marketing people need to know what it says. It sets the rules for the road for the company for what you collect in data at a particular point in time and what you can use going forward. So the fact that maybe you're collecting gender information now, if you say you're not going to use that information to provide it to anybody else in the future, you're kind of stuck with that, right? The regulators say you are stuck with that um, until you figure out a way to change that in, or in a method that makes sense and is acceptable to the marketplace. So you need to think about that going up front. The other thing that you need to talk about your engineers back to um, the platform point is you need to know how the platform work, works. If your app is developed in sort of a privacy envelope that doesn't take an effect of the features of the privacy of uh, the platform that you're using, let's look at Snapchat, right? You know, then you're going to be in a situation where your application, your use, what you're trying to do does not actually meet what you're saying even in the privacy policy because you load it on a platform that has a much more robust feature set than you thought of initially. And that kind of gets you to the point where you launch off the platform and think about the business. And Laura, you wanted to add something to that? Yeah. Um, I mean, as somebody who spends a lot of time advising developers in, in this area, um, I mean, you really have to simplify it for them in some ways. Because this, I mean, for those of us who are, who are privacy professionals, it's it's important to know the deep dive, right, and understand where the administration is coming from, where the FTC is coming from. We, we have to know that. But the way I distill it down uh, for my business colleagues is don't surprise people. Tell them what you're going to do, and then do what you said you were going to do. Um, I spend a lot of time in the trenches with the user experience folks, um, and, and we talk about that a lot. And we play fun games, like how, how few words can we say this in, and, and you know, how few characters can you use. You can get really pithy, um, and, and I find it helps me a lot to focus on human readability um, in the privacy statement, in any specific notices that we provide. Um, the more human readable you can be, and the more genuine you are when you explain, here's what we'd like to do, we're asking you nicely, um, please. And then people will generally say yes, as long as you can explain what's, what's the value for you. So in this instance, right, this application can provide value to you if you are cool with it, understanding where you are geographically. Uh, and then it's up to the application to actually provide that value. Well, that's great. I needed a, a, a bike share. Um, it located one just around the corner. I didn't even know it was there. That's awesome. Um, so, but, but you have to explain it in a really clear, accessible way. M make people understand how would you feel if somebody suddenly sucked up all your contacts and you didn't know? Uh, what, what if you had contacts in your database that you didn't particularly want to share with this application? The question I have uh, for you guys is, is one of the things in the setup here. Um, the app is collecting, at this point, gender and date of birth as part of registration. Uh, but, but in the scenario, they're, they're not using it yet, but they're maybe planning on using it in the future. Um, so Jim, I guess we should start with you. I'm, I'm interested in your take on OK, bad thing. If Maybe if we're going to be using it in six months, is that cool? If we're, we, we know at some point in the future we're going to use it, but we're not sure when. But what would you tell the developers? There's a cynical answer, and then there's the answer I'd probably I give. I love right? cynical. <laughs> <laughs> the, the cynical answer is you want to collect as much information as you possibly can if you have something that you think is going to be feature-rich and valuable to advertisers and marketing people. And you want to let people know from the get-go, hey, we're collecting this data. We may use it. We may provide it. We may do whatever you want with it. If you give us this information, we can do whatever we please with it. Right? Um, that's a cynical answer. And I think, actually, there are lots of companies or lots of um, apps that are structured that way, and they do work that way. The, the nuanced answer, or you know, the lawyerly answer, is that you want to be careful about the information you're having because it is sensitive information. In a startup phase, you don't have the controls in place yet to really develop protections around sensitive information that you know you might be taking in from an app, and you may want to think about rolling out slowly over time as you build your app and get more and more traction and more and more controls around the data you're collecting that information that you collect. Because frankly, the information you collect at the beta stage, that is gender and date of birth, you're probably not going to use it and sell it to the advertiser. Because they'll probably be interested more when you have scale. And when you have scale, you'll be developing um, security protocols around the information you're taking and how you're storing and how you're processing it. And you're not sitting in a coffee shop coding where anyone can look over your shoulder and see what's going on. And I think you know what, one of the things I would I would add to that, Kathy, when you introduced this, you said that 
you, you know, m most startups, and I, I think there's a lot of truth to this, they don't think about privacy when they're when they're first building their product. This goes for apps and otherwise. You know, they're um, they're they're all about the business. They're you know, as, as Laura mentioned, they're they're all about you know, kind of pushing this out, and it's about the engineers and the product development folks. What we're seeing more and more, even with very early startups, these are you know smart people, and they are calling in privacy lawyers um, very, very early on because they understand that even if uh, if it looks as if this is an app that is about you know it's about green, it's about you know kind of environmentally friendly um, services, it's really all about data. You know, that is what is going to make this app function. That's what's going to make it interesting to its users. You know, thinking out, that's what's going to make it interesting to some company in three, five, or eight years that's going to buy it for a lot of money. So, um, so it is really important, I think, to bring privacy folks in very, very early to start working with your product development and your engineers at the outset. They need to understand exactly these issues. I, I think, you know, I share Jim's cynical view um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and also his, um, you know, kind of more responsible perspective. I would say that if you can, you know, if you've got a pretty good sense that you actually are going to use data and you're going to use it pretty soon but not right away, collect it. And, you know, I say that having um, been a part of the team at the FTC that said if you're going to make these material changes, you need to get opt-in consent. Um, it's a challenge. I, who knew? It's very difficult to go back uh, to user base and, and get them to consent to a different use of, um, of, of information. Um, but if you've, or, you, but if you can, if you're able to kind of collect the information and explain in the privacy policy how you may use it, you can address that issue as well. You know, Lydia, that's such a good point. And, and one of the things that, that one might run into, um, there are a couple different things, right? So. If, if we don't include gender and date of birth initially, and then we have to add it later, oh, user experience issue, barrier to entry, right? You're gonna hear that. Um, anytime you want someone to, to click a button or tick a box or fill out an extra field, it's perceived as a barrier to entry. Um, a, a potential counter to that is, let, let's say for sake of argument, Ecocentry is not gonna use this for at least a year out. Um, establish yourself as an app, establish that you're adding value, then add a feature and collect the additional information, but present it as, we've got this great new feature, current users who know and trust us and know we're not messing with your stuff. And to Jim's very important point, it gives you time to work with your information security crew to build any extra layers of security you may want to have around that extra data that you're collecting. Um, data birth is sensitive. That's an issue, right? Data birth, along with a couple of other points, you can figure out somebody's social, and then you can really go to town. So you want to be helping think folks think iteratively, um, both on, on the business side and then in terms of legal and operational impact on the back end. I also think it's important to think about security, just building yeah. on um, what Laura said at the outset, because that's another place that I think startups don't always pay enough attention. I think people generally know you need some level of security. Uh, but this is you know another area that I think people are probably aware that the FTC has been very active in really going out and challenging different companies on their security practices. Uh, and then on the flip side of that, if there is a data breach, uh, that can be very, very damaging uh, to uh, your customer satisfaction. And if you're a small app, I mean, it could even just wipe you out, particularly if you have things like date of birth where people really feel threatened because their data was breached. So it's important from both a customer uh, service and customer experience standpoint uh, and uh, the regulatory standpoint that you have good security and it's so much easier to build in good security from the start mm -hmm. than it is to add it later. The other thing I wanted to touch on briefly here was the analytics question. So you'll see we have mm -hmm. the concept that uh, we're using an analytics provider and uh, as Lydia said, data is all important uh, these days and analytics providers uh, do provide a key amount of data oftentimes about where do the users click? What are the users interested in when they move around the app? 
Uh, and this is a place where you have to work closely with your developers as well to determine what kind of data the analytics providers are actually capturing. Because I have found multiple times when I ask, well, what are they capturing? It's like, oh, it's all aggregate, anonymized, et cetera. And I'll say, well, are they capturing user IDs or device IDs? Oh, yes, we capture those. Well, do you track, get information reports by user and device ID? Well, of course, we have to have that. Okay, you're right square into uh, privacy again because you need to consider user IDs and device IDs as personal identifiable information uh, because they can, through various means, be coupled with an individual. So then if your analytics provider is collecting these things, and the way the analytics providers collect them is because you put a piece of code into your app that you send to uh, your customers. Um, I've had people say, developers say to me, well, the analytics provider has this great privacy policy. Well, that's fantastic, but it's not fantastic if your customer never sees it because your customer doesn't know that the analytics provider exists or is collecting data. So this is another thing you really have to, to drill down into Say, okay, if my app is the way that this analytics provider's code is being delivered to my customers, then you need to cover that in your privacy policy as well. Again, going back to that disclosure question. And vice versa, you need to have your privacy policy covered in your agreement with your analytics provider to make sure they're not sharing the data right. or using the data in a way that you say that right. it won't be. Uh, and that kind of goes to the strategic point. Right? Many, we're now at the point of the economy. Uh, for these types of apps where people now begin to see the differences between how people approach. And there are studies now that are coming out that are saying that companies that approach privacy and security as a strategic goal um, to the point of getting people from the get-go thinking about data handling, data security, data use issues, um, they'll have better success than those that act as a, basically a catch-up or a defensive on data privacy and data use issues. So I think to recap, what we're, what we're pointing out is try to think about security and privacy from the beginning. Um, think about surprise minimization. Um, think about, um, and even if you're collecting information not classified as highly sensitive or sensitive, such as medical data, I mean, in this context, for example, um, you could easily be um, uh, disclosing biodegradable diapers or something like that. So someone who's interested in that they probably have babies. Well, that's it, and maybe that's incredibly useful for advertising purposes, which we're going to talk about next. But that's also something that could be off-putting to the parents of that child. So you really want to think about how to make notices clear, and you know, think about just-in-time notices. Think about not having long, um, detailed, you know, policies at, at a high reading level, especially on a small device screen. If that's particularly important, really try to put yourself in in a in your user's um, position and think about these issues from day one. So now we're going to, um, now we're, we've got a successful app and we're ready to try to monetize it. So we're going to move into the world of targeted advertising. Okay, so the um, fundamentals for in-app advertising, they're pretty much the same, um, uh, it, it works pretty much the same way as it works in the online context. Ad networks use a unique identifier, and Ruth has already touched on the sensitivities associated with unique IDs, but they use a unique identifier to track a device across apps and over time. Um, that is really, that is the definition of online behavioral or interest-based advertising. And if you're doing advertising on your app, you certainly want it to be interest-based. You want to, uh, serve your users with advertising that is most relevant to them. And for our startup, we, we, you know, we have a whole lot of information about what our users are particularly interested in. Um, so as you kind of move this onto, it's an app, so it's on, you know, it's going to be on the iOS platform and the Android platform, and instead of having a cookie doing the tracking on Android, it will be the Android identifier on iOS. It'll be the identifier for advertisers, the IFA um, that's used on Apple. And, you know, as I said, these are, these are pretty much kind of similar tracking, um, tr tracking methods. And if you are on the mobile web, tracking is by cookies the same way it is um, uh, in the online context. The other um, 
uh, a, a kind of thing that we would need to learn about and be concerned about as a startup app is, you know, are, are we going to seek out one ad network? Um, how are we going to determine who to use? Or are we just going to go to an ad exchange? So ad exchanges are platforms that facilitate buying and selling space on multiple ad networks in real time. It's, um, it, you know, it's pretty amazing. It, it's great for startups. It really allows smaller ad networks and publishers to scale. And that's why it's, it's particularly attractive to startups. But there's an enormous volume of, um, of buying and selling that takes place on these networks. And, um, and so as a result, it's a lot more difficult to control either where your ads are placed to make sure that as a startup, if, if we're buying um, advertising space, to make sure that our ads are only appearing on places that we're comfortable with, and also to make sure that only ads that we're comfortable with are appearing on our um, app. So for example, you would want to, you know, in addition to, to having all of the privacy um, uh, protections in, in your contracts, if you're advertising, you would want to have a, a you, you know, you would want to have something in place with your ad network that says that s certain types of ads maybe we want to have them screened out. We don't want anybody advertising who's going to um, uh, potentially dump ma malware on our users' devices. We might not want um, advertising for, we have, you know, alcohol. I, I was going to say, we have a left-leaning, we don't want guns advertised. We might not want alcohol advertised. I, 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 I like alcohol. I like alcohol, too. <laughs> <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't where I, where, whether, where, where I was going. But at any rate, we want to do, um, we want to, you know, we want to make sure that um, that we have some control over the ad inventory that shows up on on our app. So, um, so we also we've talked a lot about the fact that we collect uh, gender and age information. That is incredibly valuable information for an ad network, um, and. It also can be interesting information for us to use. We have, with gender, date of birth, name, and email address, we have more than enough information to work with a data broker, for example, and to, um, and to find out. We, we know our users are interested in environmental issues, um, but we can go to um, uh, a, a broker and find out which one of our, you know, 500,000 users is interested in um, environmental travel, uh, you, you know, kind of trips that are focused on, um, on environmental issues or, you know, a whole slew of other, uh, of other things. And data brokers can help us append offline information in activities that our users engage in offline. Um, there are inferences that can be drawn about their preferences, and we can attach that information uh, to, to our, to the profiles that we have about our users. Now, um, it's, uh, uh, Jim mentioned that the FTC recently issued a report on data brokers, like um, analytics companies. Data brokers are invisible to our users. They don't know um, who these uh, who these entities are, and so it becomes our responsibility as the user-facing company to be very clear with with our users and tell them in a way that doesn't freak them out um, uh, what we're going to be doing and that we're going to be working with third parties to, um, uh, we, we may collect additional information about you from third parties so that we're in a position to serve you even more relevant and interesting advertisements. 
And I'm going to say, finally, because we are on mobile, we have a leg up on, um, on other advertisers because we have location information. Mm -hmm. We've got this device. If you check, if you click on location, which is really to share your location information with us, which is really essential in terms of making our app usable um, uh, for the um, for the day, for you know the group of people, um, you are sharing your location information with us, and so we can make sure that you get ads in real time. That when you are going by. Um, an eco-friendly store, you can get uh, an ad maybe that has a coupon that encourages you to go in um, and, and visit that store. It, it really, it makes advertising, it makes online advertising in mobile even more powerful. Um, so, you know, what does the government require? We've, you know, we've hit on a lot of this already. Um, it, in many ways, in-app interest-based advertising, it's kind of the perfect storm for privacy. Uh, the California AG and the FTC have staked out privacy as a significant priority. Um, they have also um, both identified location as particularly sensitive information. And, um, and, you know, I think we've already touched on the amendments to the California, to the CALAPA, which require more specific uh, disclosures when a third party is tracking you on a website or an app. Um, and I would just note that Attorney General Harris has opined that in um, all of the kind of California laws and reports that talk about websites and online services, she is of the opinion that they apply to apps as well. And so if you're an app, you really need to play, pay close attention to that. Um, Letty, you, you, you said a few things that really resonate with, um, with me in terms of uh, with, there's the scariness factor, yeah. right? So, and, and, and there's sort of, I'm thinking scariness factor, I'm thinking throat to choke, and I'm thinking first party versus third party. Right. right. So, so a lot of what we're talking about here involves third parties using data that our, our application client may have collected, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that seems to really be the tipping point, the, the point of most concern for regulators. Is that accurate? More, more concerned about sharing across ecosystems? So, I, you know, I think it is not so much that they are more concerned with that. I think it is, it's kind of what is the newest on the radar. Mm -hmm. So when, um, I, I think that cross-site tracking in, you know, I'm going to say 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, that was like huge. It was just starting. And uh, I, there is a self-regulatory program in place that's addressing that. And now, um, you know, I don't know that the regulators have completely wrapped their arms around cross-device tracking. But I think now there's a lot of concern about sharing with third parties, in part because there's not yet that same um, level of transparency that I think the industry has tried to address in the interest-based advertising mm -hmm. area. Um, you know, and it is, I think, it's much more of a challenge when you're dealing with entities that are not known to the, to yeah. the consumer. And, and I guess related to that, the, the other thing, and this, this goes back to some stuff that, that Jim and Ruth was, were talking about earlier, um, it, it seems that the regulators are looking for, and so I'll go back to the throat to choke, and I'm sorry that that's quite a violent image, but, um, or, you know, choke points or, or, or points where um, end users can be given notice or, or where we can build in uh, safety nets. So, for example, at the platform level, California Attorney General reached out to platform who said, thou shalt make sure the people on your platforms are, are doing this. They're now reaching out to data brokers. Um, uh, the, there, there was the kerfluffle where, where, where the online behavioral, behavioral advertising industry came up with uh, the, the little eye icon, icon right? right? And so there, there are efforts to self-regulate here to, to make sure that information is getting out. But, but it, it sounds like um, that that's a point of concern as well, is figuring out where in the ecosystem we need to be looking to make sure that we're surfacing notices. Right. So I think that I, I think that if you are as the consumer facing app, I think, you know, that we need to really focus on that. And um, 
in terms of advertising, an another issue that's really important is we need to make sure that if interest-based advertising is taking place, that our ad networks are complying with the self-regulatory program because that program has morphed ov over into the mobile environment. And so is everybody here familiar with the little advertising icon, little circle, hands? Okay. Um, and if, That's more than we would have had a year ago. I, I guess. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> so um, uh, do, do folks here know about those internet things? No, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> the interwebs. <laughs> yes. So, so next time you're, uh, you're shopping online, just look a little bit more closely at the advertisements that you see. And in the right-hand corner, there should be this little blue icon, and next to it, it says Ad Choices. And if you click on that, it will you, you can kind of drill down into notice and choice about online behavioral advertising. And you can see what um, uh, ad networks and analytics companies are embedded in the website that you're um, on and that are collecting information about you and what they're doing with it. And you have the opportunity to um, exercise choice about whether they can collect information from you. So you know that is a very interesting way in which um, companies that are not consumer facing have found a way to interface with consumers. Um, I, you know, I, I would say maybe even more challenging for the industry that we call, you know, data brokers. Um, I, I think that it, because they are not engaging necessarily online, um, they may be, but a lot of the data that they're collecting is from public record information. Very big, very big challenge. Um, w one of the things that, that I just want to kind of touch on quickly is, um, is the, you know, kind of real difficulty about providing good notice in your privacy policy when you are collecting any information, but particularly um, geolocation information. The, um, and, you know, the FTC, California, very interested in this. The FTC brought, um, uh, brought I think, one of the more interesting mobile app location cases. Um, it was Golden Shares about this, uh, I think it was the most popular flashlight app. Um, and the, um, the company actually disclosed, and the company shared information with third parties. They collected information and they shared it with third parties. Um, they, um, and, they sh and they collected precise geolocation information. They disclosed that they collected and shared information in their privacy policy, very general way. They didn't say anything about geolocation information. Now, they also did something that, that I think the FTC was probably even more concerned about. They started collecting information before they, uh, they presented the user with um, the end user licensing agreement. And so, information was collected before you had the opportunity to even agree to anything. The FTC charged both practices were deceptive. Now, I, you know, completely understand the, they said, we're going to get, you know, we'll, we'll only, co we'll collect this information and they started collecting before they gave you any choice is a big problem. But when you think about it, they disclosed that they were collecting and sharing information but they didn't have a separate disclosure that addressed geolocation. And the FTC's position is that this is essentially deception by omission. You've said something, but not enough. Um, and uh, you know, as a result, the, the company is under a 20-year order. Um, the order requires just-in-time notices, we've already talked about just-in-time notices, that discloses the geolocation is being collected, how the information may be used, why it's being collected, and the specific third parties that the information is, um, is being shared with. I, you know, I think that the takeaway that I have is that if you're collecting geolocation information, 
you really you need to be very very uh, clear with your users um, about the fact that you are collecting this information. And I think the other important takeaway is that um, when you are drafting a privacy policy, even for a young startup, be really careful about it. You have to really vet everything that you say in this. So I want to go back quickly to, before we move on um, to, our, to the next topic, um, go quickly back to something you mentioned, the cross-device tracking. And I think that the, the advertising icon that we're talking about here is, as we've said, a really interesting example of the industry taking the initiative in response to a great deal of regulatory concern um, and, and potential pressure to, to set some standards. And as a result, I think it's fair to say that there is a certain comfort level when companies are complying and participating in those voluntary practices. Um, you know that you're not, there's that saying about you don't have to be faster than the bear, you just have to be faster than you know, the, the, the other people running from the bear. Um, I, I don't know what people's thoughts are, but I, I think it, it is perhaps a, a realistic perspective when things are moving so fast and there are so many new innovations. And admittedly, I think regulators would be the first to admit that they are having a hard time um, wrapping their, their heads around every new thing that comes out. So with, with the advertising icon now, um, we, we have, um, and so, so when you have regulators, you have the state of, of flux where there's not a law, um, especially in the U.S. I mean, there may be some uncertainty as to, well, can we do this or not? We want to be first out of the gate. We want to be one of the first out of the gate. But there are no standards. There's no, we don't know if regulators are even aware of, of this innovation. And if they are, we're not sure of um, where they might come down. On it, and maybe we'll be an easy target because the plus, there are pluses and minuses to being the first out of the gate for something innovative like that. And, and so, Kathy, so, I think that that's where that, that don't surprise people really comes into play, right? So, if if, yeah. if you're if you're on the cutting edge, if you're on the bleeding edge, and you're innovating in in, in a data privacy space, it, you got to get with your user experience folks, stat, and and really talk about how are people going to react if you have the time and the wherewithal do a little bit of a b testing but frankly use your common sense i mean it's to tell people what's going on in, in a human understandable way in a respectful way and as long as you're focusing on on having that respectful open relationship and and, and offering people some level of choice or control um my gut check is that will go a long way to staving off concerns because the big concerns the FTC tends to have, right? And, and Libby, you can tell me if I got this wrong, but it's um, doing something other than you said you were going to do, doing something and not telling people you were going to doing it, do that, and, and then changing the rules when you were in the middle of doing something. Um, as long as you're not doing one of those three things, you're already ahead of the game. So like, it's a very, very true. Just what, just one, one thing I, I, I would add. I, I, it's, it, it is not surprising. You know, a lot of companies think, well, if we sign on to a voluntary self-regulatory program, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like this has nothing to do with the government. This is just, you know, us mm -hmm. and the other members of the industry. We've decided to do this, maybe with a little pressure from the government, but. You know, we've done it, it's a good thing, and leave us alone. Not true. If you um, are a member of a self-regulatory organization, most, organiza most self-regulatory self organizations, trade associations, um, will require that you affirmatively tell your users, we comply with these self-regulatory principles. And once you make that public statement, just as the public commitment to comply with the safe harbor principles. Once you make that public commitment, if you fail to meet it, the FTC can, and I can assure you, will allege that that is a deceptive practice. So it is, it's not just jump in and comply, it's, you know, and say you're going to comply. It's understand what the self-regulatory program is and implement it fully and completely and make sure you're in compliance. I think from the lawyers in the room too, I mean, one of the things that should come across is that you actually need to understand what's happening as well. Mm -hmm. And you need to sit there and sometimes you hear people say, you know, we'll ask a client, well, what's the data flow? What happens at every step? And they'll say, why do you need to know? 
and you need to know exactly so we can answer these yep. questions. Yep. And, and yep. that's like the most important thing that you all can do is to see that because you'll catch the flashlight problem, right? You'll catch that and be able to time the notice to the data reception. And that's key for you to do as it, and, and if you don't understand it, get someone who can help you. So we're going to move on now to the next phase for our startup. Um, so our startup is doing fabulously, and it turns out that it is a, a oh, I'm sorry, what's that question? I just wonder if you're changing all these difficulties that this operator is to satisfy this system with self regulatory standards. Do you have another recommendation to satisfy the law and the requirements of the system? Or are you basically saying the best you can do is the little asteroids and there's nothing else? Well, so you know, if you're doing um, if if you're doing in-app interest-based advertising, if you're doing interest-based advertising in the mobile context, you need to comply with um, with these principles. It's interesting. The uh, the principles are enforced by the Council of Better Business Bureaus. They have this online accountability program, and the position that they take is that even if you haven't signed on to the principles, but you're engaging in interest-based advertising, they apply to you, and, and you have to comply. I haven't quite yet figured that out, but, um, but that is the position that they take. So yes, you do need to do it. So the next phase for our startup is social media. So Lara's going to walk us through some um, benefits and possible pitfalls in connection yep. with social media. Yep, and I want to push through this really quickly, and, and we just want to encourage you guys again, um, ask us questions in real time, and I, like I said, I'm going to push through quickly on, on this so we can reserve some time at the end for questions, but um, some things you're going to want to think about, and um, caveat, this, this is more the e-commerce component of this conference than necessarily the pure privacy component of this conference, but um, Things you will want to think about. So, what what they've done here, uh, the EcoCentrics decided to create an incentive program. Um, join the incentive program, get re great rewards, and, and one of the things you can do is promote uh, EcoCentry on your social media platform of choice. Uh, now, there's all kinds of tracking that's got to be involved in that, right? So, you, you need to understand who was the first to promote. If you get somebody to sign up. Uh, what data stream do you need to know that it could be that, that I got Lydia to sign up so I get credit, um, but Ruth got Jim to sign up so she got credit, but, but the Jim, I, I invited Jim too, so what's up with that, right? So there's all kinds of tracking that goes on on the back end, but here's the main thing. If I'm incented to do this, I need to tell you in some way I'm being incented to do this. Otherwise, you know who could get a little upset? Oh, it's our friends at the FTC again, right? Because it's, an, it's a type of endorsement, arguably. So if, if I am getting something for promoting this to you, if I'm getting some benefit, I'm getting some benefit for you guys signing up, I, I'm in some ways effectively behaving as, as though I'm an advocate or I'm, I'm a paid endorser for EcoCentry. There's an argument to be made there. Um, so as you're, if you're designing a program like that, you're going to want to think about how can we get folks to, to disclose uh, appropriately so we don't trip up. So that's one quick social media point. Um, other things to think about with social media, uh, and I'm going to invert this completely and, and talk more about the company for a second. Uh, we are wildly excited now. We're at huge, expansive growth. We're hiring, 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 hiring. Hey, let's check out folks' social profiles and check out the people who we're hiring on. And oh, check it out. She's pregnant. I may have just created a little issue for HR, right? So in multiple states, I've lost track of what's it, 16 now and growing, something like that. Um, basically now have laws on the book saying you can't do that. You can't require people to turn over social media credentials. You should be really mindful if you're going to check out people uh, on social media because you, you may end up getting information in, in, in your mind palace that really shouldn't be there when you're making employment decisions. Um, so I'll just hit those two issues, see if anybody else wants to add anything to that. Connection as well on social media, sharing, you know, Pinterest, mm -hmm. Facebook, or whatnot. Mm -hmm. You know, you're sharing data. It's coming across an API. You need yeah. to think about what the policies are that are taking place. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you're thinking about that or you have uh, folks who are looking at that, you need to read the Hulu opinion. Um, it's really, really interesting to see, you know, what happens when you put a like button on a page, or what happens when you're sharing data with Comscore? How does that all work? 
you, um, you want to have a social media policy in place for your employees. Um, they're really excited about all of these new features uh, that you're rolling out, and they want to talk about them and blog about it and talk about it on their social media outlets. They actually need to disclose that they work for us. <laughs> Um, because if they don't, we can all get into trouble. And the other thing is, we want to have a policy in place that says who can speak for the company. We want to be very clear um, and, and maybe actually tell our employees not so much. We know you love us, but uh, you know, uh, when, when you're on Facebook, uh, talk about something else. And people mean well. They yes, mean well. You absolutely. know, and it's out of love and from a good place, but um, they're arguably needs to be a little bit of command and control here because it, it's you're impacting the brand identity. And, uh, you know, goodness forbid you disclose something uh, proprietary that upsets our other friends over at the SEC, right? You don't want to get information out there um, that that should have been disclosed in the filing and perhaps was not. Um, and there's misunderstanding because we've said something on, on the social platform. Um, so, so you just, you want to be mindful, right? You want to be mindful with all of these types of disclosures. And you need to make sure you keep both heads in, you know, if it comes, ah, if you're public, you want to make sure that you're worried about the SEC issues. Right. If you're dealing with labor policies or internal, you need to think about the NLRB as well because they have standards that they've set about what you can and cannot disallow an employee from doing, which means you can't just gag them completely. Yeah. So you need to actually keep in mind that all these issues cut across, you know, things that are novel but things that are also, you know, quite settled um, but being applied to a novel application. So speaking of going public, so our startup's doing really well. They're going global, they're going public, and they've hired a general counsel. So we've talked about um, the fact that our, so let's talk about what the general counsel might flag. And um, one, of the, one of the issues that will come up is that, so this startup has been based in Wisconsin. Um, let's assume its users were in the US, but it's going global now. Um, it's, it's expanding rapidly. And what kinds of questions are triggered by, by that expansion? And what kinds of things might the general counsel start asking about um, as she's joined this company? Do you want to start on that, Jim? Sure. Give us some thoughts. The first thing I would want to know is who are all my partners? Right? How many people are we really interacting with uh, for the platform? Who helped develop the platform? Who are we sharing data with? And do we have all the rights that we have in the data to share that overall? Because actually, it's an IP technology play, and I have to worry about the fact, do I have the rights in the data that I'm exploiting ultimately? Because if I don't, and I can't do that right, or I can't do that well, I don't have a company to take public. I know, Ruth. Um, well, I think you know, one of the things that you know, we've got up here on the slide is the international considerations. And, and you could even back that up. We've talked a lot about California law. Uh, and I think one of the reasons we put our startup in Wisconsin that we haven't touched on yet is the question of well, what we've talked about California law. We're all California lawyers probably for the most part here in California. Uh, we're going to think about complying with California law. You know, when you start out, you might just be thinking, well, I'm going to comply with Wisconsin law. And truth be told, I don't know that any of us are actually even qualified <laughs> to apply on Wisconsin law. Uh, but it's important even at the outset to start thinking about, well, what's going to happen when you get out of, of your zone? Um, California residents are very likely to use mobile apps, so even at the outset, even if you're just launching in the U.S., it's pretty risky not to take into account California law, and it's not really that difficult to comply with California law. Uh, however, when you go global, it does become much more difficult. And I think everyone's generally aware that the EU has a much more stringent uh, set of privacy controls, and so does Canada. I mean, you don't even have to go very global. Wisconsin's closer to Canada than uh, to <laughs> California. Uh, Cal you know, Canada has a um, privacy protection law, and you may not have set up your app to actually deal with um, getting the kinds of opt-in consents that in many cases are required when you go outside the U.S. So, so that's um, one big thing that you want to think about. Jim mentioned the Google case early on. Are, are people generally familiar with that case? So, Jim, you want to give us sort of the, the minute highlight? I think there's a couple of implications that have you know, sent people reeling. Well, um, let me take it from a different direction. OK. okay? Um, the EU Constitution has a right of privacy. Um, the California Constitution also has a right of privacy, just to keep in mind. Um, 
And there was a recent ruling that coming out of the EU courts that basically allows people to petition to be forgotten from a search engine, right, to have certain entries removed. Um, it's akin to some laws that we see here in California that will take effect early next year for teenagers, the California Eraser Law. Um, but also, it goes to the bigger question of data regulatory um, requirements around data brokers, the right to manage your own data, and regulators thinking more and more about how data is being used. Um, I made a comment earlier about data brokers and the recommendation that came out of the FTC report for legislation around the portal. Um, and I look at that and I say it's not practical because even if you get certain brokers to sign on, not everyone's going to sign on. There's going to be a lot of tracking going on with folks. But it's really when you think about starting a startup and thinking about the data you're collecting and who you're sharing with over time and how much data gets collected by you or shared with others, it's really hard at the end of the day to unring lots of bells. Right? Um, I have four teenagers. I tell them that all the time, and they remind me that as well. Right? Um, you know, what goes on online is not being forgotten easily. Snap, the Snapchat settlement, I think, is a good example of that. And that's something to keep in mind is that there's going to be more and more pressure, I think, for regulators to try to figure out how to address that unringing of the bell um, without necessarily there being much you know, industry appetite for doing that unless forced to um, is my personal perspective. And I think there's, there's also a global social issue, right? We, we have all these toys that as a society we're still learning how to play with and learning how to share and share appropriately, right? So if, just by way of example, if, if somebody does a limited share with me on a social media platform and I, I go to reshare that, um, probably good if, if, if I've noticed, oh, hey, it was a limited share. Do I actually want to be sharing that out with everybody publicly, right? And that's not, there, maybe there's a platform trigger, hey, Jim said, small group of people, you're really going to blast it to all 500 people following you? Um, it would be nice if the platform had that reminder, but really that's on me. And, and I, think, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, regulators are trying to control us, but as a society, I think we've also got to get more used to this and, and figure out what, what, what the rules of engagements are going to be. The other aspect of the Google case that's really interesting is in addition to the substantive decision on the, the right to be forgotten was that it, Google fought the, the jurisdictional um, question here. And they took the position that the data controller was in the U.S. Um, and, and the regulator um, was, not, was not satisfied with that argument. So it's opened up a lot of questions um, to the extent companies have tried to maintain their, let's say, their center of gravity in, let's say, the U.S. or a region, an area that is less um, perceived as less stringent in its, in its data protection enforcement. Um, that 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 is now that question is 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 wide is is fairly wide open and it'll be interesting to see how how it how it plays out. So that's another aspect of that opinion that if you know if you're interested you know there's a lot of news coverage about it. You you can probably find more information. Well, well that feeds into the Wisconsin issue, right? Mm -hmm. you, you have to take a, a certain respect in the United States a least common denominator approach, but internationally you have to worry about all these issues. It plays out when we think about Fourth Amendment rights. It plays out when we think about the right to be forgotten. It plays out when we think about where do you store your data and who you would allow to access that data regardless of where you're building your data business around the world. Um, different countries have different rules that apply and the question is whose jurisdiction will you be submitting yourself to but also fighting ultimately um, so as a policy. Any other closing thoughts from our panel? Um, thank you so much. And I know we didn't have lots of time for questions, but we're certainly happy to hang around afterwards if people have questions. Thank you.